Hello, welcome to the V2V podcast. This is another episode of our Survivor Series. My name is Marcus Parrish, and today I'm going to be talking with Kayla Herbel. She is a nurse and a um, postdoctoral fellow at Missouri, is that Missouri State University? University of Missouri. Excuse, excuse me, pardon me, University of Missouri yes. and... <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got to make some mistakes. So, uh, what we're going to be talking to Kayla about today is, um, of course, the uh, troubled teen industry in general, but more specifically about a particular um, research study she's doing with um, moms who, uh, for whatever reason, um, and we're not trying to judge the reasons, but who have chosen to send their children to uh, residential treatment centers. And so we're going to get into kind of what that's about and look at the industry from her uh, scholarly perspective and then wrap it up talking about some alternatives that, that might be, uh, it might be a better choice. So, um, that's kind of what's going on today. Uh, welcome to the show, Kayla. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, and, you know, you guys, you found me because I, uh, I, I joined a survivor group on, on Facebook, and um, Alexi was kind enough to tag me and ask if, if I would come on the show. And absolutely, because I'm sure when you read my flyer that I'm looking for moms of troubled teens, um, I'm sure all types of senses are going off. So um, I would love to talk about, you know, my perspective as a nurse scientist on the troubled teen industry, as well as the research that's going on to kind of um, curb some of those efforts. So I guess I'll start off by defining troubled teen industry. Is that okay? Sure, yeah. Um, it's kind of what we like to do in, in general when we have people on to um, because everybody, you know, has an individual perspective and, and it's, it's a really varied, uh, universe. The, the residential treatment center, wilderness schools, therapeutic boarding schools, they, there's a lot to it. So depending on each individual's background, we'd like to get Certainly, their perspective on on what is what it is from uh, their point of view. So, yeah, um, what is the troubled teen industry? Sure. So, um, what com- comes to mind for me is it's an industry that capitalizes on hopeless parents. Um, it, it takes advantage of parents who feel like they have no other mm-hmm. option. Um, the troubled teen industry is incredibly unique in that it doesn't discriminate against race, creed, religion, socioeconomic status, you name it, unlike a lot of other institutions out there. I think the troubled teen industry, part of the reason why it's become popular in recent years is this idea of, in schools, you know, labeling kids as uh emotionally disturbed or seriously emotionally disturbed, which evokes quite a reaction, right? I mean, like, just gutturally, when you hear that, you're like, oh, my gosh, what what could be done about this? Um, or, or, or what or what in the world is this kid doing? Um, and yeah, that covers a wide range of things, too, from from a kid who, who gets caught in his room smoking a joint to the kid who's uh, – you know, throwing rocks through windows or uh, it's a skipping huge school. Or it's, it's, it covers a huge swath of um, so-called uh, behaviors. So um, there is some of that to it, too, kind of everything to everyone. Mm-hmm. It's just it's a really ambiguous label um, that is just, you know, you have a kid that's seriously emotionally disturbed, you know, the teacher – labeled them as that, and maybe they saw a school psychologist and they're coming up with this diagnosis or, you know, this label, again, of the serious emotionally disturbed. Well, what can be mm-hmm. done about that? You know, what? how am I supposed to handle that? Oh, I know. Right. I'll send them off to this fantastic-sounding wilderness retreat or, you know, whatever. And, yeah. 
Um, right. it, it's interesting how how parents find out about this stuff too. Uh, I know a lot of times it comes directly from, for instance, a public school counselor who who may or may not have appropriate information regarding the school itself. All just like anybody else, they might have been presented with something that sounds different than what it really is. Um, mm-hmm. But they don't have the resources to necessarily investigate that because, you know, we as people like to take people at their at their word. Mm-hmm. And when and when there's a you know a large institution that is coming forward and saying we can help, um, it's it's likely that you know many people will accept that on kind of on the um, the logical fallacy of authority, perhaps. Um, mm-hmm. The idea that oh well, other people have gone here. These they've been in business for twenty years. They must be doing something right. And then you know they could present it with testimonials, positive reviews, their glossy brochures, right. and whatnot. Right. <laughs> you know, and that's one of the things that I think of is the brochures. How it's like a timeshare, right? I mean, you you talk about how fantastic it is. It's like, you know, a vacation, but it it couldn't be further from the truth. It's incredibly punitive. Um, And one of the things that also popped up in my head when I thought about, you know, the residential system is the idea of polypharmacy. Um, Hmm. As a nurse, we see a lot of kids, or when I was practicing, I should say, um, because now I'm fully devoted to research. But when I was practicing, we would get these kids from from the residential system. And I'm not kidding you. You could have an 8-year-old, and he could be on two to three antipsychotics, um, throw in hmm. some Ritalin maybe, maybe some Xanax for at night. Like, wow. Just this, this drug regimen that's like, how can this kid function? How can they be and, functioning? And 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 then that leads to the question: Are they really functioning, or are they just so drug addled that mm-hmm. they appear to be normal, or they appear to be sedated, or they you know they're or they are in fact just so sedated or um, or affected by by the drugs that they stop responding as a as a normal child and are more compliant right yeah absolutely. right because you i mean you can you can produce the appearance of i guess uh normalcy by prescribing and and administering the right combination mm-hmm. of of drugs um it's uh well, sure i, I mean it's, with a, the right it's combination. a situation sure right yeah well, and with the right combination, of course, you know, if you get a kid that's quote unquote aggressive coming into your facility, I mean, it doesn't sure. take much to knock, you know, a ten year old down to a submissive, you know, nothing with with these drugs that are out there. And I'm and not that's saying not, that medication. That's not even to say, and that's not even to mention um, uh, missed uh, dosages, or you know. Um, oh. Or because that brings up a whole new raft of problems when the kid is withdrawing mm-hmm. and acting out because they're in agony and can't express mm-hmm. it, um, and then that is then again seen as as a failure of the child to conform and behave when in reality it's it's their drug regimen has been messed up. Mm-hmm. I mean that's a reality as well for sure. Absolutely, and part of that goes hand in hand with also, you know, multiple diagnoses. Some, um, in my experience, a lot of times not necessarily correct. You know, you can have a kid with this quote serious emotional disturbance come in, and really, you know, they're just depressed. They really just need a little bit of therapy. They don't need to be in a residential, um, you know, hopped up on a ton of drugs and experiencing god knows what else right Um, one of the this reminds me one of the um criteria that that one of these uh schools i guess i'll call the school loosely Mm -hmm. um uses to determine whether or not 
uh, your child will, would be a good candidate is whether or not the child is bored. Like they, they go down to, to that level of behavior, like just kind of general dis, disinterest. They, um, they're using anhedonia as a, a fancy word that maybe some people don't understand. They actually are using that as a diagnosis. Um, that your child needs to come to this place to be cured of their boredom. Um, yeah. it, it gets, it gets bad. Um, that's not a, that's not a thing. Like, that, that's, yeah, that's right. not a medical diagnosis. That, that's normal. That's a kid who mm-hmm. perhaps needs more, needs more uh, parental interaction, more things to do that they're actually interested in. Um, mm-hmm. but certainly not, it doesn't rise to the level of needing residential care. But it, that's exactly. true. That really exists. Well, and it's just astounding to me how more and more documentaries, podcasts, books are coming out about the troubled teen industry. And I found this stat that I thought was just staggering, that there's still 55,000 youth per year in the residential treatment system. That's huge. Yeah, it is huge. That's and, huge. And some of these schools... Um, charge out of pocket $100,000, $150,000 a year to send your kid there for, for a year. Oh. Um, it's, it's incredible. And they, and because of the way that they're regulated state by state with, with governing bodies that are oftentimes populated by executives from the schools themselves, mm-hmm. um, there's there's almost no oversight. In fact, you can start up a residential treatment center, unlicensed, operate it, get found out that you're unlicensed, plead ignorance, take a year and a half to get your uh, paperwork in order, and continue. There's wow. there's relatively little shutdown of of these rogue uh, institutions that just pop up and begin operations taking tens of thousands of dollars a month from beleaguered parents. They're even, um, because of the, the way they formulate their, their curriculum and, um, treatment models or what they present as their treatment models, you can even, uh, get insured for a number of months, uh, mm-hmm a month to 90 days as like a drug treatment center. Um, right. So they can get, kind of get you going for free in some cases. And then, um, and then they'll tell you after a certain amount of time that your child isn't done and that they need right. more, you know, and then, and then it's time to, uh, get a second mortgage on your house. Right. Um, it's, it's, this is all, uh, this is not hypothetical. <laughs> this has really no. happened, and um, and it's a shame. And the, um, part of the reason that we're doing this is to, you know, spread the word that, that this is going on because most people really have no idea unless they're actually involved, which is a really small percentage of a population that that knows about this kind of thing. You're totally, but big, you're it's, totally but right. But it's big enough. But it is big enough so that it affects people who aren't even a part of it because um, these kids and, and these and these parents who, for whatever reason, send their kids to these places, they affect everybody around them. And and you may not, and we, you know, the general pu- public doesn't necessarily know what these people have been through. and mm-hmm. And we're not trying to place judgment on on the the customers, so to speak, on the parents and, and certainly not the children. Um, and we've even spoken to ex staff who uh have had have seen abuses and have decided to get out of the field and mm-hmm. they're invited as well to to come on and speak about their experiences too. So it's um right. It's a big deal. Um, it's not well known, and, and that's kind of what we're doing. Um, 
So, so knowing all all that kind of you know the the monster that we're dealing with, what what led mm-hmm. you to your current study, and, and and what is it? I know you're you're working with moms, so how did that come about, and and what is yeah. it that you're doing? So um, my background is, like I said, a nurse. Um, I worked in a psychiatric uh, clinic for children. I want to be clear, it is not a residential. (laughs) Um, And, you know, working in that center, we did a lot of parent education, and we also got a lot of kids in in the center that, um, you know, had had been in residentials. And I want to be clear when I say residential, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily, in this case, where I live in the country, mean um, the for-profit, uh, like, worst of the worst center. It, it's not great either, but it could be for, like, an eating disorder or substance, mm-hmm. like rehab, something like that. I want to be clear. Um, well, sure. And I want to be clear, too, that that there are there are facilities that do good work. And mm-hmm. that's not really what we're talking about. Um, right. I have I have a background in um, in uh, in drug treatment um, mm-hmm. and with adults. And you know, the, the, when these people come into come into the um, the facility or the or the house, or um, they're treated with do respect. Respect. Um, they're treated as people, not not as uh, yep. not as uh, you know moral monsters or right. Or, a uh, huge difference. Or bad people. Yeah. Or bad people. They're treated yeah. as if they have a um, which you know the, um, the popular conception is that they have a, a physical disease that that should be. Um, Treated as if they had a heart condition or, or whatever. It is. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and what that you know as you know uh, what that what that does it puts it, it puts the person on, on equal footing with the uh, with whoever's providing treatment as people, mm-hmm. um, and and then progress can be made, and we're not you know um, saying you're you're less than. Um, mm-hmm. And there are programs in, in that fall outside of um, what would be called the troubled teen industry that actually do good work. And we'll get into that mm-hmm. a little bit, I think, after you talk about um, sure. your study in particular. But uh, but yeah, so I want to be clear too that uh, that not totally. every yeah. <laughs> that not everything that people do for other people is bad. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, you know, from a scientific perspective, um, so obviously before you do a study, you do your reading. I mean, you really have to know about the phenomena that you're looking at. And um, what's kind of interesting is in the literature, they don't really um, differentiate between the type of centers that are doing good work that are technically residential treatment versus centers that would be classified as troubled teen industry. And there is a huge, huge difference. Um, So that's like one thing that I think people who are working in this industry, or not in the industry, but in this scientific area really need to be intentional about. Um, Part of it comes down to part of it comes down to credentials um, in a lot of cases, too. It kind of of goes back to the idea that Say if a, if an MD is the head clinician at a particular uh, institution, it uh, it catches people's attention and and they figure oh well if a, if a doctor is is on the masthead mm-hmm. as as the top guy then it, it must be okay. In a lot of mm-hmm. cases, that doctor has very little to do with actually what goes on and. Right. They they're not even on site, or they have mm-hmm. you know very little to do with with the actual operation of the place. Right. And then generally, what you get is a a long list of licensed clinical social workers who seem to be working way outside their bounds in a lot of cases. Yep. Um, yep. 
social work, you know, I don't mean to be controversial, but social work isn't science. And, and you, you, the idea that, um, the social worker who, who has a, a real, um, purpose, um, isn't necessarily equipped to perform the duties that a lot of these schools say they provide. Um, mm-hmm. And from from work, and, and it covers a huge range of, of quote unquote problems too, from from the autism spectrum to um, uh, your drug use, just um, uh, oppositional defiance disorder, mm-hmm. um, and they they wrap all this stuff in, up into into one, one program, and then and then I I'll take a look at uh, the qualifications if I can find them for the for the staff, and and more often than not, their backgrounds, their work history, it just doesn't match up. I agree, absolutely. Yeah. So what are you doing? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. It's it's like so fascinating. We get lost in the, oh, I know. The I'm show. like, oh, my gosh, someone who finally gets it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate um, that. Yeah. So, yeah, so we're working. So my background is with pregnant women, okay? And, um, I, you know, I love mental health. I That's been, you know, kind of my beck and call for quite some time. So, um Clinically, I work with children, but in working with children, you have to work with parents, right? I mean, generally speaking, we well, know sure. that 55% over over 55% of treatment plans uh, specify that reunification is going to be the dominant discharge, you know, disposition. Um, it's kind so of the idea, me, right? Like that. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's what yeah. they say. I mean, <laughs> if it's sure. ideal, if it's if they're a fit parent, you know what? That's great. That's fantastic. But um, so, yeah, so a lot of my clinical work um, was spent educating parents on um, behavioral disorders, mental health disorders, you know, kind of um, destigmatizing it, um, Mm -hmm. avenues to talk with family about, you know, certain things you might be seeing in the child, how to not cast judgment, how to explain it, you know, really trying to be sensitive. to you know, because some, sometimes parents they don't they don't get a handbook, right? They don't get a handbook right. about a parent that says, "Oh, I have a child with a mental health disorder. This is what you're supposed to do." And in fact, there's mm-hmm. a lot of information out on the internet that is not great. <laughs> um, right. This you know, <laughs> this reminds me of. Um, to... Sorry, to pause you for a second. This yeah. reminds me of of the talk I had with um, uh, the. Uh, doctor of philosophy, or excuse me, doctor of psychology. On, I was thinking about you, doctor of philosophy. Um, yep, Kevin Fall, um, who realized that he not only had a troubled teen, he was in fact a troubled parent, and mm. that realization led him to be able to uh, reach out, uh, remain firm, set boundaries and bring his son back into the fold because he admitted his own mistakes because he yep. realized that he wasn't being an ideal parent. So, of course, his child is going to be lost in a sense mm-hmm. and and uh, seem to be moving away from him because um, children are very intuitive, even if they can't express exactly what it is that, they're feeling or, or they don't have a vocabulary to express themselves. But people tend to forget right. that, that children, even though they may not be, may not be able to say it, know what's going on in their own terms. And so, um, I guess that kind of brings it back around to this idea of, um, of parents having this responsibility to, to make, um, the best choices possible for their kids. And if they, right. if they don't know, if they don't necessarily know what their options are, they may make 
you know, poor choices out of ignorance. Right. Well, you're, and you're exactly, yeah, absolutely. You're exactly right. And it's, you know, moms are, the reason I chose moms for this study, and it's, there's no bias here, um, but moms, you know, are primary caregivers a lot mm-hmm. of the time. I don't have the percentage offhand, but it's just, it's what it is. And so that's why in this study we're looking at moms. And specifically, we're looking at a really unique subset, and it's moms who have prior trauma. That's what we're looking at here. Because I hypothesize that moms who have prior trauma are more likely to seek out residential treatment for their child because of potentially unresolved coping with their own issues. Um, so that's kind of the, the crux of why I'm doing this research. Um, because again, you, you parent differently when you have trauma. You absolutely do. It's a different experience. Sometimes you read into things that may not be there. Um, I mean, it's just, it's an incredibly underlooked, uh, phenomenon. This, this mm-hmm. idea of moms with trauma who has a child with a behavioral substance mental health disorder. Right. Right. And, and may, there may be an absent father, um, or, I mean, a number of things could be going on sure. that uh, that need uh, that or that that play into the decision making process that, that these moms are faced with. So, and that's um, what that's what we try to get at is you know I try to go from like a, a storytelling perspective. You know, tell me about what it led up to so and so entering residential. And again, this doesn't necessarily mean the troubled teen industry, but just residential. You know, tell me about sure. it. You know, what, what, what were they exhibiting? How were you dealing with this? Um, you know, kind of talk me through the decision making process. And then also too, what I'm interested in is, okay, after they get out, now what? You know, how are you going to potentially mend that relationship? Because even if it's the best case scenario with residential, that child is likely going to have some resentment there. Because it's out of home sure. treatment, that's out of home placement. So, right, and you know, that's always like the mental health, the mental health community. I know for certain that um, the consensus is that that at home treatment or within the family treatment is always preferable for better results. Right. It's like it's just right. if if you can avoid sending your child away, yep. do that. Um, and then, and I realize that this is. Uh, it's a new study you're still prospecting for and that you know, mm-hmm. you're getting into it. So um, I'm, I'm not necessarily asking about conclusions because you haven't reached them <laughs> yet. But I'd be really I'd be really interested in finding out later when this is conducted kind of what some of your findings were. It'd be, I think it would be really would, interesting to come back on. I would love to do and that. talk about that. Well, and, so, you know, I think, I think research is um, – a vital part of research is giving back to, to the community, right? And I think it's the step that is most often skipped, unfortunately, mm. um, in my own experience. So, um, and women who participate, they know this. Um, they get the papers when they're published. They get to know the results. I did this in my previous studies. And I feel that, you know, I have a, a better connection with the community, um, and especially in this case, a community who really is not trusting of an outsider. Um, right. And, again, I get it. But, you know, any little step that we can take as healthcare providers and researchers to kind of mend that, I'm more than willing, you know, to do. That's exactly what we're trying to do here is to provide transparency. Even if in, in the case of this industry in general, the mm-hmm. – the troubled teen industry or therapeutic boarding schools, we are uh, trying to do our best to provide transparency, even if it's forced, even if, mm-hmm. even if, uh, even if they're not reluctant or they're reluctant to, uh, to be uh, as transparent as they should be. Right. My job is to kind of force that issue and let people know, um, this is what you're getting into. This is where you're sending your child. Um, mm-hmm. And oftentimes, it's not speculation. It's, it's using their own literature, their own words, their own um, work history, background, education. And it's, it's stuff that's like for public viewing. But again, 
people in, in these states with, you know, they're pulling their hair out, not knowing what to do with their child, not right. having good mental health of their own, perhaps. Um, mm-hmm. They don't look deeply enough into where they're sending their kid. They're they're just taking the institution's word for it because mm-hmm. it, it's a professional that's coming to them with with all of the you know the bright and shiny stuff and um yeah so so i'm i'm really uh grateful that you're kind of looking into this because it's it's important and and uh and i i haven't this is a it's a unique study i think i haven't i haven't come across anything quite like what you're doing and i i think you will provide a lot of uh benefit to to moms and, and kind of the community in general. So that's, that's uh, good for you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, our so, hope is to uh, get, gather this pilot data in, in hopes of, you know, submitting for a NIH grant, um, specifically to benefit, you know, incorporate both moms and the kids. Um, yeah. Potentially before entering residential to kind of figure out, because clearly there's an unmet need, right? Clearly. Well, right, because they wouldn't be thriving if if no right. one was sending their children there, right? Right, right. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> true. They would they wouldn't be in business. Um, yep. So, aside out, outside of sending your your child away, um, what are the and then this may be out of your scope, but what in your estimation are the or more, I don't know, reasonable, viable options that, sure. that parents can undertake if they have yeah. what what appears to be a troubled teen or or child, for that matter. Um, uh, yeah. Um, do you have any? I mean, do you have any suggestions uh, outside of sending your kid away, or, or are you? Marcus, I have a literal of... page for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go go for it. Just just. Don't worry, I won't read off every bullet point, but I was, you know, kind of stewing on this yesterday. Um, Uh And Yeah. Um, The one thing that popped in my mind that I think is so underused is respite care, um, which is this idea of, you know, having this, quote, troubled teen go to a safe space like a relative's house, you know, Uh for a weekend or a week just for the parent to breathe because sometimes when, you know, you're confronted with this stressor, you, you can't think clearly. I mean, physiologically, we know you can't think clearly and make good choices. So I can't right. underscore enough. People don't take advantage of respite care. Sure. And from um, my own personal experience, I'll just, like, put this out there. My father sure. was killed when I was, when I was nine. And mm. my mom was in a lot of distress and trauma. Of course, he got killed by a drunk driver. It was really immediate. They had been divorced, they had reconciled, they were planning on getting remarried, and then he died. Um, now, what happened with me is I became really independent at about like ten years old. I still had a home, I still had food, and so there was there was like a loving presence in the, the home before. My, but my mom had had really emotionally removed herself. Um, from like the family um and initially she set me up with like a big brother when I, which i firmly rejected because mm-hmm. i saw it as a cheap replacement um so there is i mean so sometimes these things don't necessarily work out but it, it's worth the effort yep it's worth I, it's totally worth trying totally. and i and later on i appreciated the I did find that I appreciated the gesture and it really, it, mm. even though it's not something that I, um, appreciated at the time, after the fact later, it did make an impact even though, even though I said no. <sighs> like it, right. it, things like this, the, even the, even the attempt, to find some kind of respite care, whether that's with a family member or an outside party to come and 
um, you know, lovingly with with that kind of purpose to take the kid out of that environment, even for a time, does have benefits. So I agree. I agree. And, again, these are all options because out-of-home care should be the absolute last resort. You need to try everything, everything, because we know, based on outcomes, based on outcomes-based research, we know out-of-home care isn't the best option, you know, for sustained improvement in the child's function and the family function. We know that. Um, right. That reminds me of another incident, uh, a survivor yeah. that I spoke to, who was going to a uh, psychiatric clinic in Texas. They referred her to a residential treatment center, and mm -hmm. it was bad. Uh, she told her story about all kinds of, like, really nasty things that went on there. After I spoke to her, she found the courage to go back to the psychiatric clinic and say, hey, you know that place that you referred me to? This and wow. this happened and this happened and this happened to not just me, but to other kids. And so what this clinic did is um, on a like a blanket basis, they are now refusing to refer kids to this particular place. So mm -hmm. um, even even the professionals don't necessarily know, you know, where they're sending these kids to, who they're referring them to, um, because even even psychiatrists can get buffaloed, you know. Even right. <laughs> um, right. So to your point about it, you yeah. know it. At all costs, do your best to not send your kid away because even even the people that you think have and maybe do have your child's best interests at heart don't necessarily know where they're sending your kid to. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's yeah. where this idea of, you know, intensive home care comes in, which I think is mm -hmm. really a viable option. I understand it's expensive. I get it. But so is out-of-home care if you pay out of sure. pocket. Right. Um, and it's, you know, this idea of multi-systemic therapy, which is just phenomenal. I mean, it's a great model. It's also incredibly effective for all of the disorders that, you know, and, and behavioral issues that kids have in these residential treatment centers. So um, I can't speak highly enough about it, truly. And I also want to say, too, that, you know, as a, you know, for survivors too, if they choose to seek help, professional help for coping, I'd really encourage you to look at a place that's trauma informed, um, because you're, you're dealing with, it's, you know, not every psychiatry or psychology office is trauma informed. And I right. just can't emphasize enough that that's where you need to go is, is somewhere like that who, who, you know, isn't going to ask you 5,000 times to explain what happened to you. You don't need that. Sure. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think uh, I think to, to wrap it up. Um, sure. There's um, there's a, a, a point of view that um, that I think needs to be looked at. That it's it could be the parent, you know, it could mm -hmm. it could be the uh, the parent's mental health that is at stake. Um, and mm -hmm. so it's important to for adults with children to take a look at their own behavior and right. to to uh, get assessments of their own before they make what could be rash decisions about what to do with their children. And ultimately, right. I think with um, appropriate therapy coupled with just clear, loving communication with your kid might be the mm -hmm. best choice. I mean, that might be ultimately the best thing to do with your kid is to let them know that that you were a child too. You get it. You know that that um, skipping school or or uh, you know drug experimentation happens, and there are other alternatives. And if if you're open enough, 
to letting your child know that that you have empathy for their situation because we we as adults can get this kind of amnesia <laughs> and that uh you know and that that kids recognize like you don't even remember what it was like to be a kid so how who are you to tell me so if you know to parents out there i guess the message is is that you know talk to your kids and and find out what's really going on before you uh before you let others dictate to you what's wrong with them right yeah absolutely all right well uh thank you so much for uh coming on Kayla. it was uh it was a pleasure talking to you and i think uh i think we got a lot of good information covered thank you so much i really appreciate it you're welcome and uh i hope to talk to you soon